starting? I guess I'm just going to leave the door open for this All right, so uh, the title of this talk, I can be Apple, and so can you. If you're using Hacker Tracker, it says I can be company X, because <laughs> uh, apparently they had to uh, censor Apple out of the title. Uh, I just found out about this. So anyway, um, yeah, welcome to DerbyCon. Welcome to uh, noon, high noon, track two. Thank you for coming. A little bit about my background. I was in the Marines back last century. Uh, I got out in this century, so right on the cusp. I was stationed in Hawaii and I worked in SIGINT. And the reason I'm in InfoSec today is because I got hurt in training. Uh, and I got put behind a desk for a year. They told me to become a security officer for computers. And this is back when it was Windows 311. And basically, there was no such thing as security. So I was like, okay. Um, well, that's, you'll, you'll see that. That's my goal. Um, so after the Marines, I went to the University of Florida. I worked for PwC and then Booz Allen, Leviathan Security Group, and now I'm with Okta. Who here has heard of Okta? Raise your hands. A couple of years ago, there would be no hands. Um, so that's great. We're publicly traded now. Um, just uh, so we can come a long way. No longer startup. Uh, and I'm on the internal offensive team. Uh, we like to offend people. Uh, you know, we, through our bug reports. So I, I work on the vendor side of the house. So anything that comes in that needs to be looked at for any potential hiding bugs, I will do that and also look at infrastructure. I look at everything from routers to web apps. So I'm a full stack pen tester. Um, a real stack, not just the dev stack. Um, yeah, so I also write code for fun. That's my GitHub. I uh, wrote uh, Backdoor Factory, and I presented the first one four years ago, uh, or at least the, uh, the um, current version uh, four years ago here at uh, DerbyCon. And I introduced PDF Proxy. Uh, two, weeks after PDF, uh, two weeks after that presentation, I found this thing called OnionDuke, which was, uh, this was four years ago now, that was uh, downloading uh, infecting binaries over Tor during download over HTTP. So uh, that's enough about me. This is the outline. I'm kind of doing something different. I'm going in reverse. I'm going to show a demo. Um, and then we're going to talk about how I found this bug. But I also have an update I added because uh, some, some news came out two days ago that I don't agree with in the Mac security space. I'm going to talk about that. So what is code signing? Co-signing is a security construct that allows for the consumer and user to verify who signed code in question and to verify that code in question has not been modified. Any failure in code signing, either at the OS level or in third-party developed tools, can have disastrous side effects, especially if you're in the defense side of the house or doing incident response. Okay? And both Windows and Mac OS support the concept of code signing, uh, code signing for portable code. Now, there have been issues in Windows code signing. In the past, however, uh, we're focusing just on the Mac side of the house today. So, uh, to talk about impact in code signing, um, we're not talking about low bins or living off the land binaries per se. Uh, while they are, it's a valid way to get code execution, um, a lot of the focus is on Windows. I challenge you to find low bins in Chrome OS or iOS. Um, they might exist, who knows? But, uh, I, I don't think so, but Mac OS does have a particular, particularly interesting goal bin, which is Python, it's signed, it's protected by SIP, and so you can't look at the memory unless you have the entitlements or a uh, kernel uh, a driver. But anyway, what we want to do is persist between reboots and fool the user that what we're running is safe and valid, and that's where code signing bypasses come in. As far as impact, uh, code signing um, really impacts zero trust networks. If anybody know what zero trust networks are, raise your hand, Beyond Corp. So zero trust networks uh, is the concept of you no longer have physical boundaries on your, on, they're no longer a physical network, like a, a moat, for example, and you can have a device anywhere in the world and we can make sure that it's secure uh, and that we trust it just because your device is trusted and you have a token or something that says we trust you. 
Now, part of that is if you have a co-signing bypass, um, then the whole entire security model for uh, zero trust networks is broken. So you've got to have code side enforcement and you also have to have monitoring, which is a very important part. So I'm going to do a demo. This is, this is going to show uh, Google Santa, which is a whitelisting tool in full lockdown mode. And only Apple or native code can run, Apple signed code or native code from the, uh, or code from the App Store. And we'll, this is going to show the concept of after a phishing attack or social engineering um, or some kind of post exploitation where the user, or not the attacker, drops something to disk to persist between reboots. And this is going to show that you can have persistence and you can hide in plain sight. So um, let me pull that demo up. For those of you in the back, I hope you can't see this. I'm kidding, <laughs> just playing around. Um, all right, on the on the left we have the user, the victim. We have uh, a root shell and a regular shell. The root shell is on top, and then on the uh, right we have the attacker uh, uh, terminal. So what I'm going to do here is show you. We're going to run the calculator app. This is not the exploit. Okay, this is just to show that the calculator is just executing. It's, yeah, woo! Chuck Cloud, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Exploitation's that easy. <laughs> it just works. Um, too soon. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, this is just to show that native app binaries are running. And I'm going to show next, it should be showing, um, this is Santa. The control. I'm just going to show what the status is, and it's in lockdown mode so that only Apple signed code can run. So I'm going to try to execute uh, NCAT or NetCat, and of course it is blocked, um, as it should be, because it's not signed at all. Now I'm going to show um, where LS lives. And this is a maliciously patched LS with a backdoor in it, and it's in user local bin. This is kind of neat because this is. Uh, showing what the default. Who here uses Homebrew? Uh, yeah, Homebrew. So if you, you if you do the default install, you have a privilege privilege escalation bug. If someone gets on your workstation, if if you do anything, I'm going to show you that. Um, and so I just drop a malicious, malicious ls in user local bin. Okay. And so if I use ls, I get code execution and it contacts the attacker on the right. Okay. So now I'm going to show the path of root. And you see that user local bin is first. That's the fault. Okay, so if you have any root scripts that run through sudo, whatever, those and you don't set the path specifically in the environment variables or, or in the beginning of the script, then whatever is in user, user local bin is going to execute. Um, just keep that in mind. So now I'm going to execute ls. And now I have a root shell. Okay. I don't, I'm not popping any counts for you. Sorry. So next I'm going to turn off um, Santa or put it in monitor mode. And I'm going to bring up, I'm going to use Patrick Wortle's What's Your Sign tool to show that, to check to see if this is signed by Apple. See who's signed by, and it says signed by Apple. And then I'm going to use cosign tool, which comes with the operating system, which shows code signing attributes. I'm going to show you see com.apple.ls that that is an identifier that this is signed by Apple, and then I'm going to check to see if it's if it's valid, and it says it's valid. And that's the demo. First demo. So, how does this work? Um, well, this was released June 12th, all right, and this made a pretty big splash. Um, but the details are so, this takes advantage of the FAT universal binary format. Um, 
what needs to happen is the first file in the universal file or FAT file, I'm going to explain that in a second, uh, must be signed by Apple. It must be either I386, 64-bit, or even PowerPC. Uh, the malicious binary or non-Apple supply code has to be ad hoc signed uh, and also uh, compiled I386 code if you're targeting, let's say, um, a x64-bit uh, operating system. You'll see why in a second. And the CPU type and the fat header of the Apple binary uh, must be set to an invalid type for the first for the first file, or it needs to be a non-native chipset. And I'll explain this. So it exists in the difference between how the Mako loader loads sign code versus how improperly used code sign APIs check sign code is exploited via the malform universal fat binary. And let me make this my presentation. Okay, so this is the FAT file format. All right, um, we have two architectures, uh, and each slice is the same program compiled for a different target CPU. So I three eighty six is for I three eighty six, and X sixty four is for X sixty four. Pretty simple. Um, and there's no signing on the FAT file itself, so you can modify this all you want, just not the mock binaries. And the vulnerability exists in the difference between how the Mako loader loads sign code versus how improperly used code sign APIs check the sign code. So let's create a Frankenstein binary. Um, and how I did this, I, I compiled netcat to i386 and I ad hoc signed it. And I used the lipo command, which is a real command to create fat files. I kid you not. It comes with developer, <laughs> it comes with developer tools. You can use lipo to add create fat, or you can use LiPo to thin it. I did not, this is not something I wrote, this is Apple back in the days when it was created. I don't, I don't know. So, anyway, so we have our universal file or fat file. Um, you'll see that Python is first, ad hoc, ad hoc signed, or self signed, netcat is next, or incat is next. Um, and I'll go over, uh, yeah, so anyway, so I'm showing the cosine here, uh, or at least the cosigning here. Um, so you'll see that netcat is indeed ad hoc signed, and the team identifier is not set. So this is important because you could have used this. I'm just showing you Apple signed binaries, but you could have used this on um, applications not by Apple if you could set the team, ad uh, team identifier. And that is a challenge. Um, there are no tools that do it right now. I would, I would have to write one. Um, so yeah. So we're just going to attack Apple binaries. So if I take and copy netcat Frankenstein to temp Python and execute Python, I get Python. Uh, but I want incat or netcat to execute. So how do I do this and not mess up the code signature? Well, what I do is I need to set the CPU type there in the box to uh, an invalid type or a non-native type. By setting the CPU to an invalid type or a non-native type, the Mako loader will just skip over the sign Mako binary and execute the malicious code. Um, that's how simple it is. So you take here, you see that Python is now executing MCAT. I get to listen verbosely on port 8080, and it indeed is. You'll see that it shows that it is com.apple.python and that it is valid on disk. So um, let's talk about who's affected. And everyone that I was able to test, um, that every third party developer that I was able to test that used that use cosine APIs in their chipset or in their feature set, everyone that I was able to touch. Some, some people I couldn't get a, uh, a sample of code before this came out, so I'm sure that there were silent fixes. Um, so I, I, for each bug report, I provided four samples for the vendors to verify the, uh, their bug and, and also to fix it. And each of these, should be turned non-valid. Uh, basically, the first one is, as it says, it's a bash binary. It's not signed and it has a malform header. The next is a PPC binary. It's the malicious code is ad hoc signed and there's no malform header. I found I found the PPC binary in a in a uh, install disk for OS X Leopard that I had hanging around. I just pulled it off of there and then made this malicious, potentially malicious binary. And then um, 
So bash ad hoc is just ad hoc sign binary with a malformed header that means it's invalid CPU type. And then I create a terminal app. Uh, it's, it's full application bundle. It is uh, ad hoc signed and there is a malformed header. Um, the terminal is kind of iffy when you go across different uh, OSX architecture or, or versions. So little Flocker, who's heard of little Flocker? Yeah, if you have it and you haven't updated, upgraded to Xfence, which also had it, uh, you're still vulnerable to this. Um, so Objective C, every every uh, so this is Patrick Wardle's tools. All his tools that did code signing checks were affected. I only signed one CVE because I, I like the work he does. I didn't want to punish him. Um, so the first tool was uh, what's your sign? Sorry. So what's your sign? And then the next tool was, uh, I think, Task Explorer. The, the green uh, lock means that it was signed by Apple. So a uh, Google Santa, you see that it says it's white listed, and it's also everything's in Apple. Uh, OSX Collector, the signing information. So OSX Collector only only returned errors on um, on invalid signatures. So I had to patch it up just to show that zero is meaning it's valid. Carbon Black, I've been vice of Carbon Black, um, but they they came back as being signed by Apple. Virus Total, anybody hear of Virus Total? I, I hear they're they're decent. Um, but yeah, this 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 uh, every yeah. And then uh, OS Query, anybody know about this thing? Um, yeah, so this yeah, um, Little Snitch. So Little Snitch had the best response. They would come back and say, hey, this is different than what's on disk. This might be maliciously modified, you know, like a memory or something. But if you go and check, uh, you know, and, and try to get more detail, it showed that bottom right, signed by Apple. And then if all your other tools are saying, hey, this is signed by Apple, it's, it's fine, bro. And then you, you probably just let it connect out. A lot of people would. So people were like, what about Gatekeeper? Well, so um, this Gatekeeper wasn't affected. Uh, if you use the application bundle, but also, um, so gate, let me just talk about Gatekeeper, and this is where I'm going to talk about some research that was released two days ago that I don't agree with. Uh, Gatekeeper is a security feature that enforces code signing and verifies the download application before allowing them to run, right, one time, and that's off of Wikipedia, so it's true. Um, so this is how Apple sees Gatekeeper. It's very awesome. This is how I see Gatekeeper. Uh, <laughs> so, if you've tested against Apple products, you know that Gatekeeper really isn't a security control. And we're going to tell you, go over that in a second. Gatekeeper basically keeps people that don't know they have a foot and a gun to keep themselves from shooting themselves in the foot with that gun. That's all it is. And it does help people that are not computer savvy to go and download uh, an application bundle off of a shady website. You know, that's not signed by Apple or by a valid developer certificate. Um, so yeah, it, it does help people, um, but if you're pen testing against it, it's really not that good. So Patrick Wardle talked about this in his Gatekeeper Exposed talk back in, um, I don't know what year this was, I don't know, like 2016 or something like that. I'm going to go over the details here. So what does on the, on the left is protect, on the right will bypass Gatekeeper. So an application bundles and DMGs downloaded over the browser. And also Apple can change these at any time. Uh, they, can, they can do whatever they want, it's their OS. Um, so if you use standalone Monco binaries, that's why Homebrew executes when you download it, uh, you, there's no Gatekeeper check at all. So that's why that's, that's what I use mostly if I get access to a machine, I just run Monco. Um, so if you have, you know, protect against zip bundles that you download it over the um, browser, unless you use 7-zip. So uh, if you use 7-zip, <laughs> you can bypass Gatekeeper. If a tar app bundle via the browser, uh, Gatekeeper will check for that. Or unless the user uses curl or wget on any of those file formats, and then Gatekeeper doesn't check. And also if you use it, uh, you know, if you're fishing via USB sticks and you're using an app bundle, there's no check, but I wouldn't use. Um, can somebody get that door, please? Thank you. Um, the app, I, I wouldn't use app bundles in general if you're pen testing 
Uh, it's just not worth it. So this is where I'm going to make a detour. And I got nothing against the researcher um, that had this article come out, but it ended up in Wired. And if you're going to publish something in Wired, you better bring it. Um, so this came out two days ago. It was a talk that happened at Virus Bulletin. And I don't really agree with concepts. I'm going to tell you why. And here we go. So there are three main points. Mac OS or Mac OS does not check code signatures after first run. File infection is new. Applications should do self checks to ensure no modification. Those are the three main points. I'm going to go over each one. So checking code signatures after first run. And my response is so what? And this is only for application bundles. Um, right? See my prior slides. And no other OS does this, right? Uh, there's no co-signature checks on Windows on a default install. So this is kind of a non-issue. And if you do co-signing checks, um, it has to be a binary load time where you're just being blasé about it, and that's really not a security control. So you're going to have a race condition. And if you do it at, if you do it at binary load time, we call, this, we call it this thing called whitelisting. It's been around for a long time. And you can actually put your Mac in iOS mode right now with this command. And only Apple sign code can run from the App Store. It's very painful if you do that. I've done it. And it's like, oh my god, I can't do anything. Um, so if you do that, and the reason that this wasn't a suggestion is because it negates the need for AV, and they were at a virus bulletin conference, and it works for a virus, an antivirus vendor. So, this is, yeah, anyway, file infection is new. Um, so, file infection goes back to the 80s, right? And so, it's not new. For Mako, for Mako, um, in 2006, Roy G. Bibb, which I'm sure is his real name, um, introduced a page zero method, which is no longer usable because of uh, changes in the file format. Uh, so 2006, 2012, OSX well, Reverser FG introduced a library uh, infection method. And then myself introduced um, a pretext infection method, and it's been in the backdoor factory since 2014. So it's definitely not new. And so the next point was applications should do self checks to ensure no modification. Just a show of hands, who thinks that's a really good idea? Who, think that, who thinks that's a bad idea? Show of hands. Anybody? For those of you that are on the fence or have no hands, um, it's generally not a good idea. And you're going to have race conditions. Unless it's coming from the kernel, unless it's in the kernel, at boot, you're going to have race conditions. And if I can modify the binary, I can just modify the checks. So this is part of the article. As a result of this research, Reed himself added code signature verification to malware Mac products, so they now perform a check every time they launch. And this is my response. <laughs> so my second demo. <laughs> so this, I, I got back after um, hanging out with Steve, uh, my friend from high school. They used to play drums together in marching band. He just, how you doing, Steve? Uh, we were drinking last night, and. Um, so, uh, <laughs> I get back to my hotel room at like 1.30 in the morning, and I'm like, well, how long will it take me to bypass this? And it didn't take long. Ten minutes. I'm just going to show you this and put this to rest. All right, so on the right, same concept, got the attacker. I mean, on the left, got the attacker. On the right, we got the victim. And we got the recent version of the malware vice trial. And so... What I'm, let me start over. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to copy this thing called settings test into the settings daemon. And I'm, it is a backdoor factory patched uh, version of itself. It is not signed. I mean, when the backdoor factory runs, it removes the code signature. Okay. And then I'm going to kill the daemon and then go to settings. And then you'll see that I get a... Um, Shell, as you read. And then you'll see that, oh, there's a self check. Okay? 
So now I'm going to uh, copy the normal one back, kill the process, and then I'm going to run back to refactory. Thanks. <laughs> do I have to do this now? You did, I heard it. Oh, I don't know. It's a screen off ice. I hear those are good, and it's really warm. I hear those are delicious. Anyway, so I'm going to execute back to refactory here. And um, so what I'm patching here is their real-time protection process. I'm, I'm patching a process that ensures that it doesn't get patched. Um, so I'm going to copy that over to the workstation, and I'm just going to run a real script that just does what I just showed you, just does it quickly. And then you see I got a root shell, right? I'm root. I am root. And you'll see that I didn't get any warning this time. <laughs> Because I ran fat, I there's a race condition. So I'm just gonna leave that there. And so I got nothing against the researcher, it's just I don't like bad ideas. <laughs> and there's plenty of bad ideas in our industry as it is. We need more good ideas. Um, so that ends the detour. So I decided to contact Apple about this bug. And on February 22nd, um, I sent the initial sample that was not um, self-signed to Apple. And I, I knew I would get this response. They said I, I, I need to do strict checking. So then I provided them a sample that bypassed their recommendation. And then um, they gave me another recommendation that didn't solve the issue. And then I told them how I hoped they would address the issue. And then they said that all third-party developers have to do this on their own, uh, and they will update the documentation. So is Apple vulnerable? Now, I haven't found any real security boundaries in their code that would say, yes, they're vulnerable. Though, if you look at the system information app, um, you'll see that this is my terminal app, POC, and it says that it's signed by Apple. Now, I hope you're not making um, security decisions from the security information app, but uh, so, yeah, just, just whatever. I guess it's not a bug. Um, so developer reactions were very good. This is one reaction, very succinct. This was another. <laughs> and yes, God help you. And this is another, it was good. <laughs> I'm gonna let that go again, because I love it. So. Um, so, um, April 9th, I uh, contacted all third-party developers that I could find. I contacted CERT at Carnegie Mellon, and they recommended the blog post because we don't know who is using these code, sign, uh, code signing APIs internally. Uh, I'm sure people are writing their own, own stuff, especially in the government. And um, June 12th, we had the public disclosure. And so this is their documentation for the following API at the top, before, and then after. Um, and so this paragraph specifically, I'm just going to call out a sentence or two. Be aware that the slices of the universal binary don't have to be signed by the same signer or, or the test to pass. One slice might be ad hoc signed, for example. Um, yeah, so, yeah, great. Yeah, that's it. So how do, how do we, uh, that was all, basically all that was updated. There was another API that was updated, but they do the same thing. One returns with errors, one doesn't. So how do we do this correctly? Well. There's different ways. Uh, if you're a non-developer or if you're working from the command line, you use CodeSign and you have to specifically call Anchor Apple on the app or the PID. It can check in memory. Um, or if you're doing Apple generic, it means anything that is from a uh, developer, a developer um, from a developer uh, uh, code certificate that is rooted in Apple. Um, or you can use LiPo, that fun little tool again, to thin out the fat file. Literally, it says thin. Um, pull out the 64-bit part, like out of login, for example, and then you can check to make sure that they're actually the same uh, program. Because you can mix and match different programs together. So uh, for developers, 
it's really simple. You just call this uh, set requirement array with string, and then you pass anchor apple or a anchor apple generic, and then you call those flags there, all of them, and then you have to, depending on what you want to see, uh, like OS Query, they have to break out each slice in the fat file to ensure that they're by the same signer, and by increasing the complexity there, that doesn't, there won't be any more bugs, I'm sure. Um, so penetration tester, if you are testing a product either, either internally uh, as part of a product develop, development cycle or if you're testing against anything that has code signing, um, we have some samples there, uh, Octa Security Labs on GitHub, and you can just download the samples and uh, test against the actual um, product. And all those samples should come back as invalid. So how do I find this? Well, I've been doing code, uh, code signing stuff for a while, uh, just from the nature of writing um, EDF at the back of the factory for file vectors. The, um, so this was an interesting bug, um, just out, outside of resources. And I gave a talk in 2016 about uh, hiding from the investigator, and I found a kind of a weird bug. If I added padding to, these are, the padding between each mock-o is straight zero. So if you add anything in there, um, code sign would error out. It just says something happened. Um, sorry. So this made me want to look at the universal file format in a little bit more detail. I knew that there were more bugs, you know, in that area. So fast forward with urgency about uh, almost two years later, I uh, decided to look at this again. And I, for instance, I put a backdoor in uh, Perl, and then I uh, uploaded the virus total, and I got, it was in a fat file, and I got, um, that it was signed by Apple. I was like, holy crap. Uh, so I knew I was kind of going on the right track here. So I, I come around February 13th, you know, I'm really, really in a hurry to work on this. What actually happened is I had a kid, and I just, right after that, and I couldn't work on anything else. So, um, so one thing, I wanted to see if I could create a malformed, um, a lipo, like a, a fat file with two chipsets at the same time. And I was like, can I do this? And, and I really, I couldn't. The, um, you'll see that, you know, as the error says, they have the same architectures. Generally, if you have that kind of error, if something's trying to hamstring you from doing something to protect you, you want to look at, you want to do that thing. You just want to do that. <laughs> um, that's, the, that's the, what I'm like, okay, I'm going to do that. So I manually did it. I created a fat file that would do this, and then the loader, the Mako loader failed. Um, I was like, okay. Then the next question was, is like, how can I make this execute anyway? I want it to execute anyway. Can I make, mix and match? And that's when I found that um, if I change the CPU types, I would get code execution. And after being able to create a malformed fat file, I was, able, I was quickly able to make a fat file that would bypass the third party developer code signing checks by using the Apple sign code first with an invalid CPU type. And everything else you've seen from the earlier parts of this talk. So, in conclusion, <laughs> I encourage people to take a look at code signing, especially anywhere you see it, by any product. It's a core security con construct based in math, and it's extremely complex. I believe that more third-party developers will make same mistakes again, especially since the documentation is not very good. So, any questions? Yes? Hi. Uh, first of all, awesome stuff. Uh, Thank you. Just two quick points. Yep. Uh, one, I was the speaker that spoke right after that research from on DB uh, yes. a few days ago. And I actually said the exact uh, same thing that you said. And he said, oh, yeah, you're right, but then journalists are jokes. So, the guy is aware. So okay. I just to okay, I just. Straight, straight. And we went back and forth on Twitter and he really enforced it, so. He's, he's, he's digging in. But thank, no, thank you. Um, thank you. Second thing, you just helped me uh, realize that thing about the Fed binary. The only thing I didn't check when I released it, really long, malware research, and I'm speaking about it tomorrow. So I just nice. added your point to my slides and gave some credit. So thank you so much for really helping me. You're welcome. Yeah. Well, thank you. Any, any other questions? Yes. So in your example.
example, you have two code segments for different art CPU architecture, and you try to understand. Do you add a third or a fourth or a fifth? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know if there's a limit, and if somebody wants to script that, it would be fun. That would be really fun. Like put like 300 chipset architecture together <laughs> in palette types and see what the loader does. <laughs> Maybe get code execution on 256. Yeah. Who knows? Any other questions? Yes? You mentioned earlier that there's kind of two key aspects of it. First, code signing, please do it. And second is monitoring. Uh, more the second. So if if you're uh, this is that was for uh, zero trust networks. That was in, in like if you're gonna have zero trust networks, you can't you need device trust. That means you have to have hundred percent accuracy that nothing that there's no malware on that device that could get like session cookies out. Of the browser, so you need to have um, you need to have at least some kind of code signing on that device, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, and then you also got to have monitoring. So I mean, if you were to look at Like, like, what's the most secure devices out there right now? It's Chrome OS and iOS, right? Because they force code signing it, it all the time, unless you put it in, like, unless you put the Chrome OS in developer mode. Uh, but then, if you look at the monitoring on iOS and Chrome OS devices, it's not very good. So it's kind of a yin and yang, you know, shoot, pick or poison kind of thing. Any questions? Any other questions? Yes. Yes. <clears throat> Um, I'm not 100% sure, but doesn't, uh, wouldn't iOS use something like ARM Trust Zone or something like that to uh, ensure that everything is signed? iOS right now does code signing. Right now. It, it, that's it's, it's bread and butter. Yeah. I mean, does it do it through hardware? Like a lot of it's through, it's through the, it's through the It's through the kernel. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, I think everything, I mean, I'm not an iOS expert, or at least hardware expert. I know there's a secure on play that ties everything back.